Hello, uh, my name is Russell Graves. I'm an application engineer with MathWorks. Uh, I have a little over a decade of experience working in and around our tools through two mechanical engineering degrees at the University of Tennessee with a third in the works. Uh, I have, throughout this time, I've worked with several machine learning and pattern classification, pattern recognition techniques, which really lend themselves to uh, predictive maintenance workflows. And you know that all said, I really want to start today by answering two questions. Uh, first, why would we perform maintenance in general? And then second, uh, what would make that maintenance predictive? To do uh, to answer the first question, I'll take a look at a quick example here. So the braking in this uh, braking system in this wind turbine has degraded to the point of failure. In the video. Uh, high winds are causing these blades to spin much faster than the designer has ever intended or anticipated, and this results in a catastrophic failure. And running to failure is going to really segue us right into uh, what would we define as predictive maintenance. And, and to get there, we're going to break up maintenance into three really broad categories, first of which is letting it run to failure. So uh, reactive maintenance. Uh, we just witnessed a pretty poor example of this where we wait until something breaks in order to actually fix it or perform the maintenance. And to try to avoid these big cascading failures where uh, one component, the braking system in that turbine, you know, lets go and now the whole thing tears itself to pieces to the point where it can't be fixed, right? Uh, to try to avoid these situations, we might adopt a maintenance schedule. And I think that this is probably you know, pretty common uh, where we're going to have a crew climb the turbine every few weeks or every few months and service it, you know, replace parts, inspect things, so on and so forth. And this, you know, in all honesty, the, the turbine we saw explode probably had a maintenance schedule. And that begs the question of, you know, well, could we have done something different or could we have more intelligently chosen to, you know, perform maintenance or repair that braking system or, or how could we have have more accurately made that, that maintenance decision. And these sorts of questions are where we start breaking into predictive maintenance. So it becomes predictive when we're using data in order to sort of t you know predict when things are, uh, as the name suggests, when things are going wrong and really uh, more intelligently make maintenance decisions. And you know, the kind of follow-up question to that is, well, what, what could this look like? And I can show you an example here where we used MATLAB to both build out a predictive maintenance dashboard and then also deploy it to a web application. And here uh, we're going to pivot from the turbine example to pumps. Uh, so now we have a series of 10 pumps that are sitting somewhere out in the field moving fluid back and forth, right? Um, and on the panel here, I, am really, I can really easily tell uh, what MATLAB predicts the remaining useful life for each pump to be. And I can also see several pumps that are highlighted in red, indicating that they're in need of more immediate attention, right? I can go a little further than this. And if I click on the by pump tab, and then I drop down here and go to pump three, I can see that, oh yeah, MATLAB has actually seen that this pump in particular is operating with a bearing fault. Now, you know, left unattended uh, in a very similar cascading effect, uh, that bearing could let loose some little tiny, you know, metal shavings into the inner workings of this pump, therefore causing a catastrophic failure of the rest of the pump, rendering it completely irreparable and in need of replacement in order to, uh, you know, keep our uh, facility moving or whatever, you know, whatever these pumps are pumping, right? So that's sort of an example of what such a solution could look like, or at least part of it, the dashboard, the interface, right? And we're going to spend the rest of uh, today sort of going through some basic predictive maintenance concepts, and then we'll dive into an example actually looking at the pumps in the dashboard, and we'll put together the underpinnings for two of those uh, dashboard components, remaining useful life, and then uh, which fault uh, we're experiencing, right? So in that case, the bearing fault. Uh, and then I'm going to point you to some resources that are meant to aid, uh, aid you in, in any predictive maintenance endeavors you're going to uh, take on in MATLAB. And then finally, we're going to have a Q&A session. Where we're going to answer, uh, my colleagues and myself will answer and field some of the questions you have. So feel free to 
put those on the side uh, in the Q&A panel in the meantime. Now, before we get too uh, into the example, I want to go back and take a step back and cover what exactly sort of a, a predictive maintenance algorithm is doing, right? And I mentioned at a very high level earlier uh, that we're making more intelligent decisions with data. Uh, but in between these two endpoints, we're looking at three distinct questions. Is the machine operating normally? If not, what is wrong with it? And then third, you know, how much longer can I expect this machine to operate? And these tasks, we define them as anomaly detection, condition monitoring, and remaining useful life estimation. So to answer these three questions, this is what we're going to look to. So the first two uh, boxes here are data acquisition and pre-processing steps. Uh, those are uh, sort of the most common steps across many uh, data analysis or engineering workflows. And they also happen to be the most painful or arduous part of this process. Now, fortunately, MATLAB and uh, its supporting toolboxes offers a ton of functionality to help you get through these two steps. Uh, it won't be, you know, it's not magic, but it will help you significantly reduce the pain, make that a lot easier, uh, and enable us to reach the third step uh, and the fourth step much, uh, much faster with, uh, again, less time spent and, and less of your hair pulled out. Uh, so uh, this middle area here is where we get to the, kind of the fun part, right? This is where we're going to try to interrogate the data to find some interesting relationships and really see what we can do from a predictive maintenance standpoint. And today, in, in many cases, uh, when we're talking about training, you know, training models, uh, we're going to talk about machine learning uh, because, you know, machine learning techniques are great at picking out subtle nuances between healthy data and not so healthy data. And just like we saw on the dashboard earlier, you know, MATLAB was able to tell us that that even though that one pump, uh, pump three, had 40 days of remaining useful life estimated, it was operating with a bearing fault. So that's something we caught really early on. Um, this is an iterative process, so if we fail to meet our requirements or get something accurate enough or, or good enough the first time, we're just going back and identifying some new features or picking out some new stuff, adding that in, training a new model, and, and you know, rinse and repeat until we get uh, something we're happy with. And at that time, we can deploy it. Um, and this final loop sort of creates a, a living workflow where we're continuing to acquire data from our device over time and then use that to improve the uh, improve the accuracy of the model. That said, now let's kind of dive back into the pump and look at this again. And so in the case of the pump, we have some labeled fault data. Um, and what we want to do is uh, differentiate between different combinations of three possible faults. So for a total of eight fault configurations. And in this case, we're only going to use the recorded pressure and flow data from some sensors embedded in the output of the pump. Um, and just as an example, this is the pressure data for a single operational cycle for one of these pumps uh, where we have some transient behavior which we uh, removed during the pre-processing step and then we have are left with some steady state behavior that we can analyze. And so now let's take a look at answering that second question. So again, classifying which combination of or fault we are encountering uh, this condition, this issue of condition monitoring. And let's take a look at how much you might do this inside MATLAB. All right, so we're in MATLAB and we have our data here. So if we look at this, we can see that this is simply a table of timetables. Uh, each row here corresponds to a single uh, work cycle for the pump. And for example, here in row four, if it was operating with some fault code, so we've uh, codified those three faults, the uh, the bearing failure, the seal leak, and the inlet blockage. And uh, we've got that here stored, so this is our ground truth variable that we're going to be looking at when we're trying to develop the classification technique or uh, train that classification model. And in these first two columns, we have the pressure and flow uh, data. So these are all stored in timetables, and each of these is just a time series of data um, inside MATLAB. So our data's in, and we've, you know, it's all ready to go. So the next thing we want to do is start digging through uh, features and identifying those condition indicators. And we have an app uh, that's called the Diagnostic Feature Designer, which is going to help us really easily and quickly try to differentiate features, explore the data, 
you know, and, and actually select those uh, condition in indicators to uh, feed into our machine learning model. So we can go up to our uh, apps browser here and find the diagnostic feature designer and open that up. And uh, we can go ahead and start a new session. And this is where we're going to select our data. So in this case, we have this pump data in memory. And we can see that we're importing the flow data, the pressure data, and uh, our fault code, which has been recognized as this sort of uh, condition variable. So it's, it's, it's the variable of interest. Uh, once we've got everything set here, we can go down and click Import. And that's going to bring our data in. So over here uh, on the left-hand side, you can see all the available signals in this little browser here. So we have both our flow data and our pressure data ready to go. And uh, we can then go up and start investigating. So if we click on flow data here, uh, we've got some options. We can either get a summary of that signal or we can get all trace of all of the work cycles. So this is going to plot all of those different cycles in our data set. And then we can group those by fault code. Uh, and really, I mean, this is kind of a mess, right? Uh, and this tool is gonna help us uh, parse through some of this. We can zero in down here using the panner on any area that we think might be of interest, but even zooming in here, uh, this is still pretty hard to interpret, at least to my eyes. Uh, the only thing we might be able to glean here is that there appears to be some periodicity uh, within this uh, data set. So uh, instead of uh, going cross-eyed staring at this any longer, let's go ahead and start to try to generate some features. So I can select that flow data and let's get some time domain features out of the way and then we'll come back for the periodicity that we saw. We can click on this time domain feature drop down and you can see that there's a couple of different domain specific options here, but we just want signal features. And in this, uh, in, in this pane here, then we can, we can go through and select any other features we want and then we click apply and it's going to just go ahead and calculate all of those. So again, if you're really, um, it, you know, either in either case, whether you already have an idea about which features you want to investigate or which features might be of use to you, um, or you, you aren't really sure and you just want to, you know, you know, throw some spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, we provide options for both of those here. And it's really nice to be able to just browse through all possible features. And, and when, the, when they're done generating, uh, you can actually go back here and click on this feature table view. And similar to the data that we saw previously, uh, each of these rows is a different work cycle. And we can see the fault code that was associated and then all of the features that were generated for that um, specific cycle of data and the uh, associated scores. And we'll come back to the scores in a minute. So we did notice that there was some periodicity. I have uh, time domain data here and to move to a frequency domain where I can actually investigate some of those frequency domain uh, features that might be present, uh, I have to do a power series, uh, a uh, power spectrum estimation here. So in this case, I'm going to use an autoregressive model to generate the power, uh, power spectrum for my flow data. And we're going to use a model order of 20. And I will hit apply. And that's going to, uh, again, calculate our power spectrum and allow us to go and dip into the frequency domain here and do some spectral analysis. Um, once this is done, we should have a nice pretty plot uh, of our uh, power spectrum for the uh, flow data. I can change this scale and again group by fault code uh, allowing me to glean some, maybe glean some information here from uh, from the from the plot. Um, in this case I'm going to again I'm not sure where to look maybe so I'm going to go back and, and go to our feature designer click on now we have this power spectrum data which we've um, created in our signals and spectra and I can go up here to the Frequency Domain Features drop-down. And again, you're going to be greeted with some uh, domain-specific options, but I'm just going to do the top one here. Uh, and we can, same workflow, hit Apply here, and it's going to go through and generate all those features for us. Um, and, you know, that way we can sort of see, you know, what we, well, at this point, we kind of want to know, or we have a ton of features, right? Uh, all those just went into this table. So uh, the next question, or some of you may have already noticed, uh, the, the Rank Features button up at the top right. Uh, that, that's sort of the next stop, right? We, we have all these features now. How, you know, how do they stack up? How well do those features actually describe 
the differences between those fault codes. Which ones should we use? Because uh, some features are going to be better at explaining, uh, you know, some of the faults as, uh, as compared to other features. And in cases like these, uh, really there's dimi there's often diminishing returns to the point where you know uh, you're you really don't want to keep all of the features. You want to isolate the features that are that matter the most, right? And and so this is what really going to uh, enable you to do that in a uh, much more interactive and sort of quicker way. And so in this case, we're ranking these uh, by fault code and we're using a one-way ANOVA ranking. Once we have all the features we're interested in and we're happy with the list, uh, we can go up to export and choose what export option we want. In this case, I'm going to generate a function so that I can repeatedly get these, fig uh, these same features out of a similar data set if I were to collect more data from these pumps later on down the road. So I'm going to click this generate features for functions and I can select uh, the ranking al algorithm I want to use, and the number of features. Uh, you oftentimes don't want to take all the features because, again, as I mentioned, there's some uh, diminishing returns. And so today I'm just going to take the top 10. Uh, you can hit OK. That's going to give us uh, this function, uh, which is yet unsaved, and I can name that uh, generate features or give it some more descriptive title. Uh, and then I can use that in a script. So I already have a script here where we've done exactly that. Uh, so right here we have the generate features function which has been uh, automatically created using the diagnostic feature designer. And all we're going to do at this point is we want to go ahead and partition our data for testing. So we're going to withhold uh, some of that data that we have uh, so that uh, later when we go to evaluate the performance of the classifier that we'll train next, um, we don't you know, give it the same questions on both the, the practice exam and the actual final, right? You don't want to do that. You're just like a student, your, uh, your algorithm here could cheat. And the next thing we want to do is go ahead and open up uh, our classification learner app. Now this app is going to let us uh, more quickly and easily uh, go through even some classification techniques we may not be familiar with and explore which one is going to provide the best results for our specific uh, needs. So same thing, we hit new session, our data is in the workspace, uh, so we're going to click on this and then we can uh, go in and select our data here. So we've got uh, our training features and label, uh, so we've reserved that testing set for later. And we're greeted with this sort of scatter plot um, and a couple of options here. And you know, really, again, uh, I'm not sure which classification technique is going to be the best for us. So in this case, I'm going to turn on some use uh, our parallel processing to make this go a little quicker. And I can just go over here and hit all. And you know, we can just hit the data with a stick and really see which of these classification techniques is going to best fit this data, at least just at a glance, right? Uh, so in this step, we're exploring, we're going to train all these different models, and we're going to see which one performs the best, and that may guide our selection down the road or uh, guide where we put our efforts in, uh, in, in making this, uh, this classification uh, algorithm. So you can see on the left-hand side here, I'll zoom in uh, briefly, um, we have the name of the classification learner type here, and then on the right we have the accuracy uh, and the number of features that it used uh, to achieve that. And this is validation accuracy, so again, we've, it's just on the training set, not the testing set. Uh, and we can actually go back up here and sort them by uh, validation accuracy. And we can see right off the bat that this top, this top option here uh, it is uh, a, an ensemble type learner, bag trees, and has a validation accuracy of 81.8%. Well, that's, I mean, depending on your application, that may be great. That may not, you know, that may be not so great. But we can uh, dig in a little deeper and see exactly what we're talking about when we say 81% accuracy. We can click that, and then over here we can hit Confusion Matrix. And uh, we can sort of this again, this confusion matrix, not meant to confuse you or confuse me. Uh, it's meant to show when the uh, classification learner was actually confused. If everything was perfect, we'd have 100s down the diagonal, but that's not the case. 
In fact, we can see here in this uh, fourth row that the while the true class was failure mode one one, which again is a, a, a tokenized version of our of combinations of our three failure modes, um, it predicted this correctly only about thirty five percent of the time and mis misclassified that as just failure mode one. Uh, about a quarter of the time. And you can start to really dig in and tease apart um, maybe what features, uh, again, going back to that feedback loop, what features we could include or little tweaks we might be able to make to try to improve that accuracy. Now, uh, that's if we're not happy with this data. If we are happy with this accuracy, uh, then the next thing we really want to do is, again, we, we don't want to just trust the validation data. Uh, because this is all operating on the training set and this algorithm could be cheating, we need to double check. So we're going to go to our testing data and up here we have a testing data button and we go to from workspace here and we're going to select that testing set that we reserved and import that. Then, uh, and in fact, really brutally, I'm just going to test all of these because I want to know uh, how did each of these things perform uh, on the testing set. And on the left hand side, now you can see that the accuracy type has switched from uh, validation to accuracy test. And in fact, that same bag trees algorithm uh, is performing uh, at 83.3%, which is that uh, which is the, the highest uh, accuracy of any of these uh, learner types. In the case where 83.3% is right on the money for our, you know, accuracy requirements, we can go up here to our export options and we can you know, have a couple of a uh, couple of things we can do. Uh, we can either you know generate a function. So again, going back to the the function generation repeatability. In this case, we're generating the training uh, function. So it, it'll create a MATLAB function that will train the same model over and over again. Uh, talking about that living workflow and continually refining your model, making it better and better. Uh, and we can also export the model. So in our export options. Uh, we have exporting the currently trained model, a compact version, and then a version for deployment. So we're going to hop back over to PowerPoint now. And we just got done designing our uh, fault classification uh, algorithm, training that model. Uh, so we've gone through this little piece of the feedback loop. And the next thing we want to do is uh, let's look at how we might answer that third question. So now that we've classified the fault and we know why our machine is failing. Now we want to know how much longer will this uh, machine, the pump, continue to operate. So we're going to do some remaining useful life estimation and take a look at what that might look like in MATLAB. But first we need to decide what exact, exactly we, uh, the type of model we want to use to estimate the remaining useful life. There's a couple of different options and it really depends on what type of data you have access to. So in the first case where we have complete run to failure data, so we've We've set a bunch of pumps out somewhere and run them until they failed. Then we can look at the data from the failed pumps and then compare it to the data that we're that we're seeing, and you know, kind of apples to apples, say that our pump looks like it has, you know, so long left based on what we've observed in the field. Now, if we don't have run to failure data because often it's uh, very costly to actually you know let one of these pumps run to failure. Again, often we're dealing with. Uh, taking data from things that are on maintenance schedules, we might have some data about accumulated degradation, uh, but we don't have any failure data. We still want to make an estimate as to, you know, make an intelligent decision as to when we service the, the pumps in this case. Um, so we might arbitrarily assign a safety threshold and use the existing degradation data we have to train a model. And the third option is if we only have data about you know, survival rates for similar pumps. So for example, if I knew that a similar type of pump to this failed uh, after, you know, I don't know, 100 operational hours and our pump had 70 operational hours, then we would say that we had about 30% remaining useful life, you know, something like that. We have a much more detailed uh, uh, flow chart on this documentation page, I'll specifically call out. Uh, that will sort of guide you through the process of selecting which type of remaining useful life model that you need for your specific application. And in our case, sorry, we're using a degradation model uh, because we, we don't have run to failure data. We have cumulative data uh, for uh, degradation of these pumps over time. And so with that said, uh, let's take it, let's actually dive into MATLAB and see what that looks like. All right. 
Now we're back in MATLAB and we're looking at another script, this time focused on remaining useful life estimation in the case of a valve blockage. In this case, again, uh, we're going to start by kind of acquiring or loading in our data. Um, and here we have uh, data that's been collected continually specific to the valve blockage. So as that blockage became more and more severe, we continued collecting data from the pump. And in addition to just collecting the raw data, now we've actually gone through and, and uh, created a feature set. Again, just like what we did with the Diagnostic Feature Designer, uh, we, have, we have captured a, a number of features from this data uh, pertaining to the degradation over time. And for a remaining useful life model, we want to extract or engineer one feature of that set, uh, which best describes how that pump is degrading uh, again, specific to the valve blockage. We could have selected from any of the existing features that we initially extracted from this data set, uh, but actually in our case, uh, we found that uh, we were better off engineering a feature. So we used some principal component analysis to combine all uh, several of those features from our, uh, that we extracted and create a new set of these principal components, which are features which uh, in our case better described the degradation. So. Uh, we were actually able to use the first of those uh, principal components uh, to track the degradation over time. And for us, that was good enough. Um, it's going to be different depending on your specific application or the data you're working with, uh, but that's one option you can, um, you know, one option you can look to. And uh, again, you, uh, you could use uh, run to failure data for this if you had it. Uh, in our case, we didn't have it, and we can still use uh, this, you know, compiled degradation data uh, to extract the same uh, information and apply the model. So I'm going to show you what this looks like now. So this is uh, our exponential degradation model, and it's used historic data to sort of develop a, a, an estimator so that as new data comes in, this, you know, basically the blue line, which our health indicator measured, and then our red area, the red region, is where we're predicting that we'll encounter our, uh, our remaining useful life threshold. Uh, so that threshold, as you can see here, is sort of set to uh, minus 9. Um, now, how we arrived at minus 9 is by looking at the data we already had, right? We ingest the data, and then MATLAB uh, is used to generate that health indicator, so in our case, the first principal component. So we have that health indicator over time and we're able to look at historic data and say that, all right, you know, uh, here at this point in time, uh, we felt that this pump was at a point where we didn't want to let it run any further. We were confident that if we let it run any further, if we, if we continue to operate the pump, we might encounter failure. So we assigned a comfortable threshold based on the data we had. Um, in your case, you know, you could normalize this and have a threshold of zero or uh, you, you might you know, base your threshold, you would want to base your threshold off of the information you had to hand. Um, but in this case, you can see that we were able to get this model and our estimate for remaining useful life is gonna be much better than a guess at the end of the day. It's gonna give us a good idea about when we might need to perform that maintenance. So we just finished building the remaining useful life estimator uh, for those pumps that we had. But you know, what if we didn't have access to enough data um, or you know, we just didn't have enough data to actually uh, develop that model? Well, if we had domain expertise, we could actually use our uh, physical modeling platform Simulink to build up a model of uh, that pump and artificially generate the failure data. So the way this works is you have a physical model or you have a model of the physical system and you inject a simulated failure into that model to get failure data out. And then we can use real world data to help refine and improve that model. So let's take a look at what that looks like inside Simulink. All right, so now we're in Simulink, which is our modeling and simulation platform. And we can see here that I've had a subject matter expert come in and build, uh, build us a model of this pump. If we dive under the hood of the, of the pump model, we can see that it's assembled from some more basic components and even further inside each of these plungers and individual pieces are uh, created using uh, some of the physical modeling uh, capabilities that are built on top of Simulink. And indeed, we also see that although currently off, uh, all of the failure modes that we had discussed earlier are also modeled so that we can kind of turn those on and off and artificially create that failure data as we need. 
Um, so to simulate a healthy work cycle for this pump, we can just leave it as is and hit run. And now that it's finished running, we can come up to Simulation Data Inspector, which is a nice tool for analyzing individual runs. Uh, we want to do a comparison here eventually, so I'm going to go ahead and give us the correct layout. And then we're going to look at our uh, flow rate, so Q in versus Q out. So this is what a healthy uh, work cycle looks like. So the next thing we want to do is inject a failure and simulate that. So built right into the top level of this pump model, we can bring up our pump options, and we can see there's a fault tab here where we can, you know, pretty quickly and easily uh, reconfigure any, you know, any combination of these failures uh, and simulate the model. So I'm going to turn the seal link on for uh, plunger one, and then now we're going to generate some failure, artificial failure data, uh, where we're simulating a seal leak. So I just hit run. So now that that run is concluded, we have some simulated failure data. So I'll bring back up our data inspector, and you can see here that for the current run, we have that failure mode uh, flow data already displayed. And I can go into the archive here and pull up one of my healthy runs and plot that on the bottom chart to give us a nice uh, comparison. So Q in, Q out, and we can clearly see that there's a difference, marked difference between the two runs. Um, the upper, you know, in this upper chart, this, this simulated failure data can give us a leg up on developing a predictive maintenance workflow if we didn't already have enough data from the field. All right, uh, now that we've seen how we could create some artificial data to supplement our existing data sets inside Simulink, uh, I want to move on to the next part of that workflow, which is deployment. So right now, everything lives in MATLAB, which for development is fine, it's great. Um, but we want to make sure that at the end of the day, the you know, prototype that you assemble in MATLAB can be put out into the wild somehow uh, to enable your you know, colleagues, uh, team members, coworkers, etc., to be able to access and really use the information and what you've assembled to make those intelligent data-driven uh, maintenance decisions we talked about earlier, you know, answering those three questions. So for this, we have a couple of different options. One, we could do something like generate C code and directly embed the solution to so this predictive maintenance algorithm onto an edge device. Alternatively, we could go more in the direction of that dashboard I saw I showed you earlier and uh, do something like uh, uh, compile that uh, these uh, predictive maintenance algorithms and then deploy them to a, a web app server, a web app, or somewhere onto the cloud. So. Our full workflow looks a bit like this. Remember that we were trying to use data to make more intelligent decisions based on our three questions. And to do that, we leverage this workflow. Additionally, if we didn't have access to the data or enough data, we simulated uh, our physical system uh, in Simulink and generated artificial data to supplement what little we did have. And finally, we took that solution and showed a few options for how we might be able to deploy that so that our end users could really benefit from and actually use the information to make those intelligent decisions. Now, I'm going to pivot and show you a few of the options we have, uh, kind of helpful resources that MathWorks provides uh, to uh, aid you in whatever uh, predictive maintenance endeavors you're embarking on. Uh, specifically, I wanted to call out two things. First is a training course that we offer that uh, takes place over two days, uh, and it's an instructor-led training specific to predictive maintenance. And second, if you need a hand up in uh, developing or standing up your predictive maintenance solution, we have a great consulting team that's eager to work with you uh, to uh, develop a solution specific to your requirements. So in conclusion today, I showed you how uh, you might uh, quickly and more easily stand up uh, test and implement uh, predictive maintenance programs inside MATLAB. And it, even in the last 30 minutes, uh, we just addressed uh, both uh, a, a basic form of uh, the fault classification and a remaining useful life estimation uh, with our tools. And I really thank you at this time uh, for your time, and we'll be happy to stick around and take questions uh, from the Q&A. Thanks very much.